I am trying to finish strong. I, like I've always had enthusiasm for this job. Marco Rubio, a full-time senator once again and pushing hard for full funding to fight Zika. Our exclusive interview with him coming up. We need people with real world experience. Combat veteran Todd Wilcox says Washington needs a warrior, not more career politicians. You will hear from the GOP Senate candidate. A meltdown in the streets of Haiti as that country's political limbo goes on and on and on. We will take you there. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. It's good to have you and great to have Glennon back. Well, Welcome thank back. you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be back. Just back from Haiti where an election recount is going on, but conditions are devolving without an elected leader. So concerning to so many people in South Florida and we will take you there. But first, Senator Marco Rubio, his campaign for president fell short, as you know, and so did his voting record during the campaign. He missed a record number of Senate votes, but he's back at work now full time and determined, he says, to finish strong. A top priority for Rubio is getting full funding to fight Zika, and that is where we began when we spoke late this week. Senator Rubio, good to be able to speak with you. How are you? Likewise, I'm doing well. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Senator Rubio, let's start with Zika. You strongly support, I know, the president's uh, request for a $1.9 billion to fight Zika. And uh, you and Senator Nelson are on the same page. The House, however, has uh, set aside or wants to vote for $622 million. Your colleagues in the Senate have arrived at $1.1 billion. What's going to be the final figure and why has it taken so long? Yeah, well, I think, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful or partisan way, but we should put aside this reference to the president's request. It's not just the president's request. This is the request of the people at the, uh, uh, the people that do this for us, the experts at the Centers for Disease Control, at local government officials around the country that are addressing it. And I just don't think this is an issue we need to be lowballing. I really think that we shouldn't be shortchanging it or we're going to pay a terrible price. The, there, we're not talking about apples and oranges here. What the House is proposing is funding through September. What the Senate has passed is funding for the fiscal year, the whole year. I think that's a better approach. Otherwise, we're going to have to revisit this thing again in September, October. Everyone's going to be on the campaign trail. There's a chance it falls through the cracks and nothing happens. And we can't afford that given we, the, magnet, the potential magnitude of this public health crisis. And so um, I hope we can convince our, our colleagues in the House. I know our local delegation supports more funding, and I hope we can convince the leadership over there to do that. Right. Uh, your colleagues over in the House, Ileana ross Leighton and Carlos Corbello, uh, have sided with the larger appropriation, not with that $622 million figure. Um, if I can, Senator, let, let me move on quickly here to Venezuela, a topic I know in which you have a very keen interest. It seems to be coming apart at the seams. They have huge inflation, crime. You, people can't go to a grocery store and buy the most basic kind of products. And Nicolas Maduro is sending his military out into the streets to suppress the opposition. What is the U.S. not doing to help the people of Venezuela or what could it be doing? Well, I think the U.S.'s role in this is very limited, despite Maduro's ridiculous accusations. It's really up to the people of Venezuela, who at the ballot box rejected him and elected a parliament or a, a Congress that uh, is not of his party and didn't agree with him. He's basically invalidated that by ignoring them. And uh, so I think the one thing we've done is we've passed sanctions against the human rights violators, because after the fact, when this meltdown goes through, and I hope Venezuela will be on stable footing, you're going to have a lot of these people in this government that have been violating human rights and stealing money from the Venezuelan people who are going to want to come to South Florida or anywhere in the world and enjoy the money that they stole uh, from the Venezuelan Treasury. And so I think it's important to, to those sanctions expire at the end of this year. We've passed them here in the Senate. I believe the House will pass them here soon. And I think that's the most important thing we can do. And, and then support democracy at the OAS and in other forums. Right. But if the United States were too active, I mean, whether the United States is active or not, visible or not, uh, Maduro is always going to say whatever the problems of Venezuela are, are caused by U.S. interference. Well, again, I mean, we should, we should condemn human rights violations. We should condemn what's become a dictatorship. It's important for us to speak out. Our voice matters. But ultimately, a U.S. intervention uh, is not in the offing here. This, I think the Venezuelan people will eventually work this through, but unfortunately, they're going through a terrible situation right now. 
and I'll continue to speak about it. I've been speaking about this for the better part of three years, and I think it's finally reached the boiling point here. I think it's going to get a lot worse here soon. Uh, that hydroelectric plant they have, I doubt they'll be able to function past the 20th of this month. Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, on a kind of a related topic, the Carnival Cruise Line Fathom branch has sent its uh, Donia uh, already at least on one cruise. Uh, I saw that Andre Sopenheimer and the Herald uh, wrote a very interesting column in which he said 57 years after Fidel Castro denounced the Americans coming in cruise ships and, and decadent Americans, here the Americans are again, even though this is supposed to be a social kind of social impact cruise, but uh, uh, the fact that these cruise ships are going down there, uh, you, you don't like that at all, I'm sure. Well, it's not that I don't like it. I, look, I want things to change in Cuba. I'm not even against the change or exploring changes in our relationship, but they have to be reciprocal. My problem is my interest in Cuba is solely on seeing a vibrant democracy take hold, more freedom, kind of like what we've done a little bit with Burma and our relationship with Burma. It's not yeah. perfect. They're not all the way there. There are st steps they need to take to improve, but at least they, made, they took steps. The, that, none of that has happened in Cuba. And, and my problem with tourist visits to Cuba is they are a source of hard revenue, which the current government is using to basically make permanent, institutionalize this form of government and legitimize it forever. Yeah. So when Raul Castro disappears and all the other people in this top leadership disappear in a few years, they'll have set in place forever this form of dictatorship and the world will have accepted it as a valid government or a valid form of government. Right. And, and they want the revenue from tourism to, to help create that. That's my biggest problem, not just with the cruise ships, but tourist visits to Cuba. Uh, we understand. Senator, you have returned from your presidential campaign with a kind of a huge revived appetite and uh, enthusiasm for your job as a senator, uh, what accounts for that? And are you trying to finish strong as it were? <laughs> well, I am mean, trying to finish strong. I, look, I've always had enthusiasm for this job. I've read these quotes in the past attributed to me that are completely false. I've always been honored to serve here, enjoyed my service here, like everybody in America, I think, frustrated at the lack of progress. But one of the things that has changed is that in the last two years since my party took control, we're Things are happening. You know, for four years under Harry Reid, there were vir virtually no votes in the Senate. Nothing was passing. Right. And now we're starting to make progress. Good things are happening. You know, not perfect. Obviously, we can't get everything, but we're making progress. We're having votes on Zika, on Venezuela, on, uh, on the accountability for foreign aid, which I'm going to get passed here in a couple of days. And so, you know, I'm enjoying that. And, and obviously, it's an honor to serve in the U.S. Senate. But yeah. I, I was elected to a six-year term, not to a five-and-a-half-year term. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we run out of time, I obviously have to ask you about Donald Trump. Uh, he is the presumptive nominee. Uh, it looks like he will be the, pres the GOP presidential nominee. Uh, since you dropped out of the race or in the last few weeks, have you spoken to Donald Trump? Do you have any kind of a relationship with him? And do you support him? Uh, will you campaign for him as the GOP nominee? Well, yeah, I've spoken to him briefly on a couple of occasions. I hold no ill will towards him personally. As far as a relationship, yeah, we spoke at the debates. We ran into each other in a couple of events, and, and, uh, and, and that's the extent of it, per se. But look, he, he, the voters chose him. At the end of the day, it's not that I lost the, the, the primaries, that he won it. He did win, uh, whether people agree with that or not. I have some significant policy disagreements with him. I have some significant concerns with the way he says things on the campaign trail. I've been public about those, and those remain. I haven't changed on that. Um, I, I honestly feel that he would be better served with people out there campaigning for him that uh, agree with him on more of these things, and, and I've said that publicly. So I really, what I'm going to focus on over the next six months is doing everything I can here in the Senate to represent the people of Florida, and if I have a chance to be helpful to people around the country and in Florida that are running for office, who share my views, I'm going to be helpful to them. And, you know, I don't think Donald needs my help. And quite frankly, I, I think that he would, uh, he's better served by having people out there that are more aligned with him uh, on some of the things he's talked about on right. his campaign. Uh, Senator Rubio, your friend at Florida International University, Dario Moreno, who is an excellent pollster, has done a poll in which he found out that roughly eight out of 10 Cuban Americans don't like Donald Trump, say they are not going to vote for him. Does that jibe with your experience with your Cuban American constituents? You know, I don't know. I would just say that the elections aren't today and uh, things change over a matter of months. I mean, they just do. People change opinions. If you took that poll a year ago, uh, the numbers would have probably been neutral. 
Um, we had a campaign. campaign. That's why you run a campaign. So I, I think whatever a poll shows today, right now, is largely irrelevant. We're about to have a high-stakes, high-profile national presidential campaign, and that's going to influence. And people, and voters, do change their mind before election day, and they do so often. So we'll see how it plays out yeah. in the months to come. I, I don't think any of that really is relevant at this point. It's an interesting finding, but uh, yeah. I'm not sure it really matters right now. I think these polls aren't really going to matter until October. Senator Rubio says he has no interest in being Donald Trump's running mate, and he has hired a prominent Washington lawyer to screen all those post-Senate job offers. He will get a lot of them. Oh, yes. And up next, an interview with one of the Republican candidates who wants to take Rubio's Senate seat. Stay tuned. Fierce contest is underway to fill the Senate seat. Marco Rubio is leaving. Two candidates are running in the Democratic primary, Patrick Murphy and Alan Grayson. Over on the Republican side, five candidates are running. And in the coming weeks, we plan to introduce you to all the candidates here on This Week in South Florida. Today, it's Republican Todd Wilcox of Orlando, a businessman and military veteran. Mr. Wilcox. Welcome. Glad Thank you're you. here. Thanks for having me, Michael. All right. So it is a crowded field. You are one of five Republican candidates seeking the nomination. Why are you the best candidate? Um, I think the contrast is stark. I mean, if you look at the two issues that are going to define this election, it's national security and the economy. I've got 27 years of real world experience in national security and the economy. Um, been to combat twice, led men into combat twice, served as an infantry officer in the 101st Airborne Division during the right. uh, Desert Storm, served as a Special Forces Green Beret, commanded two separate Special Forces A-teams. Nine years in the CIA as an Arabic-speaking CIA case officer uh, on the front lines of the global war mm -hmm. on terrorism yeah. in the Middle East. Yeah. And, you saw uh, combat as a CIA officer as both a, too, As both an not? Army officer and as a CIA officer. Uh, and then for the last 10 years, I've been growing not one, but three um, very successful businesses that operate in six different sectors of our economy in 14 countries around the world. I saw the uh, Tampa Bay Times did a story about you recently, and they quoted you as saying in a speech, we need to elect a warrior to Congress. Why does Congress need a warrior? We need people with real world experience. Uh, our founding fathers uh, envisioned a citizen government, not a career political class of career politicians and political insiders, that and that's what we've, what got we've gotten now? to. Yeah, if you look at the, the problems that face America, these are all symptoms. The disease is career politicians on both sides of the aisle. Um, so I am, I am the representative, the only representative in this crowded field of three career politicians and a political insider that represents a return to citizen government. One of your rivals, opponents in the uh, race for the uh, GOP nomination is Representative Ron DeSantis. He's a military guy, was served in Iraq, so uh, is he as qualified as you? Uh, he's got a very respectable resume. Um, our service is different, and, and uh, you know, you're shaped by the experiences of your life. Right. And so each of us have brought different experiences from our service in the military, and I respect his service as a Navy Reserve uh, lawyer. Um, the, the experiences he had and the mandate he has was Uniform Code of Military Justice and the Rules mm -hmm. of Engagement. My experiences in, in the military were to close with and destroy the enemy. Um, I led men in combat arms in, as an infantry officer and again mm -hmm. as a special and forces officer. And you fired shots in anger. Well, I led men into combat. Um, there, there's differences there. Uh, respectable uh, for anybody that steps up to serve, and I respect his service, but there's mm -hmm. different experiences that the two of us have drawn from our respective uh, time in the service. All right, so national security and the economy, and I think you're absolutely right, those are the top issues. Uh, how would you stimulate the economy? You've had a lot of success with your three different companies, one of which I see uh, provides logistical support for supplies to very dangerous parts of the world like sure. Libya and Afghanistan. But how, how do you apply that to the so uh, being I've, a U.S. I've senator? I've grown three different businesses um, and created more than 600 jobs over the last 10 years. So I have the experience of having made payroll, understanding the um, very uh, burdensome tax system that we have. The, the regulatory framework that is a, a wet blanket on job creators. I bring real world experience to the table when it comes to running uh, businesses in our economy and understanding how political decisions impact our economy. Yeah. We've been growing at 1.5% to 2% GDP growth because of the regulatory environment that, that's been created. There's an attack on, on capitalism right now. 
Uh, well, I mean, some people would say uh, just in the last week or so there's an attack on personal freedoms when the uh, Obama administration says that school systems uh, have to respect the rights of transgender people, that they may use the bathroom uh, with the uh, uh, gender they identify with. Do you have problems with that? I have problems with the federal government being that involved in issues that are, are clearly at the state. Um, what you're seeing in that issue, that it's not an LGBT issue, it's a state's rights issue. Uh, the 10th Amendment of the Constitution says that if it's not in the Constitution specifically, it's a state rights right. issue. Um, the notion that this federal government under the Obama administration, this hard left progressive uh, policy and agenda, would force a state to do something and leverage transportation money and education money, um, that goes to the fact that they are way out of bounds when it comes to our Constitution. So is the state of North Carolina right? Do you think they have the right to, in fact, have passed this law that says that uh, you must use the bathroom of the gender in which you were born? It, going to the issue, it seems common sense. Um, yes, I think they have the right. They passed legislation. The governor signed it. It's within the Constitution of North Carolina. Uh, again, this is a state's rights issue. And you know, the silicone class and the Hollywood class that has stepped up to say, hey, we're going to boycott North Carolina, why don't they do the same thing to Saudi Arabia and China and the other places that they operate in where mm -hmm. they make a lot of money and those countries would execute you for being a homosexual. So it's hypocrisy. They should actually run for office. Yeah. Let me ask you, I'm talking about foreign policy. We live and we have in close to Cuba and we have roughly a million either Cubans or people of Cuban ancestry who live here in South Florida. Uh, do you think that the Obama administration is right to have this initiative for opening diplomatic relations and, and possibly doing business or I would are have, doing business with sure. Cuba? And they've infused billions of dollars into the Cuban economy and we've gotten next to nothing out of that deal. Um, it's another example, along with the Iran nuclear deal, along with the disaster in Iraq, uh, the, the problems we face on our national security and, and foreign policy front, another example of this president failing the American people. The first step should have been get our fugitives back. How many fugitives yeah. are harbored in, the, in, in Cuba you know, uh, from American justice? That would have been the first step. Uh, we should lift our embargo when Castro lifts his embargo, an embargo on human rights, a, an embargo on liberty, an embargo on information. Mr. Wilcox, uh, Donald Trump is clearly going to be the Republican presidential nominee. Do you have any trouble uh, appearing on the ballot if you are the Senate nominee in Florida Absolutely with Donald not. Trump? I'll stand shoulder to shoulder with him. He is our party's nominee and the alternative is disastrous. We cannot afford as a constitutional republic another four to eight years of hard left progressive policies. And that's what Hillary Clinton would be? That's certainly what Hillary Clinton would be. You don't think she's more moderate in many ways than uh, Mr. Obama? Absolutely not. Um, she, you know, she will be an extension of the Obama administration. Yeah. She's made that clear, and she's yeah. even stated explicitly that she'll go well beyond his executive actions. Well, in some areas, she would continue the uh, DACA, the Dreamers program, among others. She has uh, certainly said that. Uh, let me ask you, one of your rivals, and I'll ask him when I have the chance, uh, Carlos Baruf, a home builder from Bradenton, uh, who got into the race, never ran for office before. Well, you haven't either. Uh, he, in the last week, called President Obama, quote, an animal who wants to make this country into a country like any other country. Is that stepping over the line? I don't think any Senate candidate should use name calling. Uh, we have a very strong argument that we can make in the Republican Party in terms of our platform. In terms of, you know, a, a free market economy, limited government, freedom and liberty, um, I think using childish antics uh, and, and those kind of terms detract from a very valid argument that we have. Yeah. It, it detracts everybody's attention to the name calling. Um, these are, you know, these are childish antics, and, and I think it, yeah. it, there's no place for it. All right. Well, you know, even in these few minutes, you have certainly kind of, I think, in a strong, unequivocal way, given us a sense of uh, who Todd Wilcox is. Uh, but there are five candidates, and a lot of them have much more name recognition and a lot more money. You're not underfunded, but I don't think you've got as much money as some of your other, these other candidates. Uh, how do you distinguish yourself? There's a stark contrast. When people see the contrast, and when we stand side by side, um, they give me that feedback. And there's a contrast in motivation. I'm doing this out of frustration and, asp and, and desperation. They're doing this out of aspiration. There is a contrast in experience, 27 years of real world experience in national security and the economy. 
And there's a contrast in substance. If you look at their websites and their issue policy positions, you look at mine, you'll see that stark contrast. Well, I, and in terms I, of money, yeah, I, I have the that. second largest uh, war chest right now of cash on hand. I've yeah. put a million dollars of my own money into this campaign. I've got the means to do more, and I'm raising money. So uh, when I get that message out, the, uh, the, the, the people are resonating to that. Yeah. You know, Mr. Wilcox, you are positioning yourself as an outsider who's going to go and reform a stultified system that doesn't work very well, you believe, and in fact it doesn't work all that well. Uh, and, and yet a group has come forward in the last couple of days to form a super PAC uh, for you. Now they can't do that in coordination uh, with your campaign, but having a super PAC kind of makes you just a regular politician, doesn't it? Frankly, uh, it, we've got to fight on a level, pl level playing field. Um, I didn't have anything to do with it, unlike the other candidates that set up super PACs and then divorced themselves of it. I mean, th that just smacks of circumvention. Right. Um, this was something, that I think, that illustrates the fact that when people hear my message, a message of return to citizen government, a, re a, a return of uh, real-world experience to, to governance, um, this is an illustration that that's taking hold. This is, this is a movement, and, and I'm a part of that movement. I'm not the only one in the movement. I see it with Trump. It, and it's a movement that's spreading across America and across Florida, and it's fueled by this fatigue with career politicians. So the notion that individuals and outsiders um, have put together a super PAC, it just illustrates that people are fed up with what's going on, and they're willing to get behind a candidate that's got this kind of message, that's got this real-world experience. That is Todd Wilcox, one of the five Republicans running for the U.S. Senate. And next, we take you to the streets of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. See firsthand the damaging effects of political limbo getting worse by the day. As you may know, a recount is now underway of ballots cast in Haiti's presidential primary last October. A runoff between the two top vote getters has been canceled three times. So the country has been without an elected leader since February, and the effects of that political vacuum can be seen on the people very clearly, as we found this week in Port-au-Prince. Doctors and nurses walked out unpaid. Dire shortages at the public hospital in Port-au-Prince are one dangerous sign of government breakdown. No pay since January. 217 employees and their personal crises are just the beginning of the calamity here. I don't know why we haven't got paid. It's the hospital director that are supposed to pay us, and they don't even know why either. Inside Port-au-Prince's General Hospital, we found darkened hallways lined with empty bed frames, operating rooms all but abandoned, garbage in the streets, buildings left unfinished, Haiti's government in limbo. As interim president, Jassolurm Prevert asked for patience to reschedule elections for the fourth time. Well, they don't have elections, they have selections. That disgust has led to weekend protests and strikes like this one, as election supervisors convened a recount of the ballots from the first vote in October. The top two vote getters then, Jovenel Moise and Jude Celestine, and a host of losing candidates have whipped up concerns of vote rigging, vote buying, and American interference. Welcome to the recount. In this airless, stifling hangar, two groups of fewer than 50 people each are working around the clock to count every single vote from the October election. And right now, they're about a third done. That's what you see in those white cartons over there. They have until May 29th to complete that. And then you may be asking, and then what? Hello, see America. Haiti is like America's little puppet. If America wants Haitian to have the election, it'll happen. Voters both expect and resent U.S. involvement, already a $30 million investment. John Kerry, persona non grata, says the graffiti. The Secretary of State has made it publicly clear patience is wearing thin. Before the, before they elect the president, they said, uh, we will do a lot of things for the Haitians, but they don't do anything. They brought the Haitians. The bitterness and frustration on the streets is quite clear to Jovenel Moise, who was the top vote-getter in the presidential election here last October. For the education problems, for the health problems, for the environment problems, you cannot stay without action. If we want to, to, to have a, a better Haiti, we need 
political stability. But political stability is also in short supply. The runoff between Moïse and Jude Celestine that would have produced a president has been canceled three times since December over fears of vote rigging, fraud and corruption. The, the result was clear. There, there are two people on the second round. I'm waiting for the second round. So that, that's the outcome you'd like to see, the second round, the runoff be held? I'm, I'm, I'm confident. We did reach out to Jude Celestine, the number two candidate, but he declined interview while we were there. So they expect the recount of the October ballots to be done next week, and those results will chart the next step. But by all accounts, an election day cannot and will not happen before August. At what least. a frustrating situation. All right, up next, we're going to take that and several other big topics to the big round table. Hillary Clinton was in town last night talking about teen gun violence and also blasting Donald Trump. And that is one of the big stories we take to the roundtable today. And we are glad to welcome back Nancy Ankrum, editorial page editor of the Miami Herald. Sergio Bustos covers Florida politics for the Associated Press. He's got you covered on all <laughs> things political. And Jackie Charles is a veteran reporter for the Miami Herald who covers the Caribbean and in depth Haiti and events on the island and in South Florida. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Thank Hello you there. Good morning. Come in. A lot Excellent. To talk about today. Sergio, you were at the Hillary Clinton event in Fort Lauderdale last night. Tell us about it. How, how, do you, how did she strike you? You know, uh, Hillary came in. It was a fundraiser for the foundation. She right. for, the spoke Sabrina Fulton for the Sabrina Fulton Foundation. Foundation for Trayvon. This is the the woman who lost her son Trayvon Martin back in 2012. Um, Sabrina Fulton actually campaigned with Clinton, so this right. is almost like a a favor returned to her. And um, she spoke in a somber tone to the group. Very well received, got a lot of applause, and toward the end, really laid into Donald Trump mm -hmm. on his. Uh, on, on his fight for gun rights and his speech before the NRA right. mm -hmm. uh, the previous day. And he is saying that there should be gun-free zones, including in schools. schools. And Nancy, that's mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, uh, Trump has said that would be one of the first things he would do as president, would be to get rid of these gun-free zones. Right, to eliminate those. Not sure that that would be within the, presidential, the, the president's power, but it plays well to his choir. It's interesting that Hillary's visit also coincided just, uh, what, a few days after the sale of the gun, oh. uh, George Zimmer Zimmerman's gun. That, um, that you know, auction. Yeah, right, oh. the auction, I think, which sold for $250,000, which, you know, it's just an abomination using this symbol to, uh, to, to, from which to profit. How big you know? do you think the gun issue will play, Jackie, in November? Well, you know, that's always an interesting issue because we see it come up in every election. Um, and I really do not expect for the gun issue to be any more important in terms of its impact on the final results. I think today Americans are just really torn and trying to figure out between these two candidates, what do I do? I mean, I have friends who are Republicans and some of them are telling me that they either aren't going to vote or that after this they're going to be independent. And then there are also people who are Democrats and who are not fans of Hillary. So I think that this is going to be a very interesting election and I would not be surprised if it's a low voter turnout election. Yeah, it may not be. Well, we do have some sound from mm -hmm. both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton last night, so you at home can judge for yourself. Let's take a listen. Unlike Donald Trump, I will not pander to the gun lobby, and we will not be silenced, and we will not be intimidated. Crooked Hillary Clinton is the most anti-gun, anti-Second Amendment candidate ever to run for office, and as I said before, she wants to abolish the Second Amendment. She wants to take your guns away. Which is not true. No, it was very interesting. Last night, even one of the mothers at the conference with uh, Clinton made it a point to say, oh, we're not here to take away your guns. We just want common sense gun laws. Mm -hmm. So even that group, and that woman had lost a son to gun violence, yeah. made exactly. it clear they weren't taking away guns. Uh, the New York Times late this week ran a, a CBS New York Times poll that I found utterly fascinating. Uh, and I want to put some of these numbers up on the board so that you see this. Uh, they asked uh, uh, several hundred, I think 700 or so Americans across the country, does the candidate, uh, do these candidates, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, share your values? 
And with 66 percent uh, of Republicans said Donald Trump does not, uh, with Clinton 60 percent said she does not. These are very high numbers. Mm -hmm. One other question they said, does the candidate have the right kind of temperament to be president? 70 percent of the respondents said Donald Trump does not. <clears throat> 48 percent uh, Hillary Clinton does not. And then the other, I think, a really important question, uh, is the candidate honest and trustworthy? And both uh, Trump and Clinton, 64 percent of these mm -hmm. respondents said no. And Jackie, this tells me that uh, voters out there just don't like or trust either of these candidates very much, not now. And I don't see how that number, any of those numbers are going to go up in the coming uh, several months. I agree. And that's why I think it's going to be very interesting to watch with these elections. But I think that they're going to be historical for that very fact that mm -hmm. voters are divided. And, and they're not feeling either one of these candidates in very large numbers. Um, recently, I was at UNC Chapel Hill, and some college students were saying how a lot of them are into Bernie Sanders, sure. and it was very mm -hmm. difficult to find Hillary voters on campus. Mm -hmm. And if they existed, they didn't want to come out and say anything. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they were not really into Trump either. So these are you know, college students who want to go exercise their right to vote, and a lot of them says they're not going to the polls. You know, Bernie Sanders was on uh, the program with George Stephanopoulos, Stephanopoulos, which precedes ours this morning, and George asked him, will you consent to be Hillary Clinton's running mate? He didn't say no. He mm -hmm. said it's too early to tell. Mm -hmm. He didn't say no. W would that even be a smart move? Not necessarily for her. And, uh, you know, they really are on in many ways, they are on the same page. There's not that much daylight between them. However, in terms of certain values, in terms of, I think, where they do want to, to lead. However, Hillary is a mainstream uh, uh, politician. She is, how do I want to say this, a usual suspect, really. And she needs someone who is going to draw, yes, those young people, yeah. but someone who's going to bolster her credibility also. I think it will look very political yeah. for her to choose him. I remember in 2008, Obama didn't choose Clinton for the VP, right. Secretary yes. of State. So where there's a spot in the cabinet, maybe for Bernie. Right. Yeah. I'm not exactly. sure which position, though. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I, I still think somebody like Julian Castro from San Antonio, the young HUD secretary, Bingo. you yeah. know, mm -hmm. really smart, attractive, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. I think that would mm -hmm. be good. Uh, he doesn't and speak from the Spanish South. very well. He's oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's true. He's trying to learn. Okay. And I think that's you just be trusted a open that huge story. I know. Yeah, yeah. He is trying to learn. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, if we can, before we run out of time for this segment, I uh, want to speak a little bit about Todd Wilcox, whom I interviewed earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nancy, uh, very conservative, mm -hmm. but this is a guy who's got a focus mm -hmm. and I think is going to run uh, a strong campaign. I, I would agree. And he used no weasel words. He was very resolute about who he is, about his support for Donald Trump, and where he thinks this, the, 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 the country needs to go. Right. Yes, he's very conservative, but he did express himself in a way that was not off-putting, that uh, did not denigrate anyone else. Right. He knows what he's about. Yeah, I, I would only say that denigrating, weasel words, words. off-putting, they're working <laughs> this year. And, yes. yeah. and, and, and there is a candidate that is like that in Carlos Baruf. Carlos Baruf. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, this exactly. is the guy who had said the president is an animal. And then, Jackie, uh, maybe you were still in Haiti or you were back, but uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, he gave an interview in which he said, no, I'm not going to uh, apologize for calling mm -hmm. the president an animal. He is an animal. Mm -hmm. He says, I get excited. I'm of Cuban ancestry. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I think on his birth certificate, he originally said at one point mm -hmm. he was born in Cuba. He, he was not. Yes. He was no. not. He was, he was not. He was yeah. born in, in Miami. Miami. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right. Sit tight. We have a lot more to talk about. But first, we'll take a quick break. Stay with us. We are back with the roundtable, and we are watching this week the events unfolding in Haiti with the presidential recount. Again, so important to so many in our community. Jackie Charles, you cover Haiti as a beat. And we were there this week, I will tell you, 
it is so difficult to cover Haiti because there is no First Amendment, there are no public records laws. What do you believe, who do you believe, and how do you verify, it, I found, was the biggest issue in reporting for the people? Well, it is. It is a very difficult issue, and there's always someone who has their version of the truth. So I see this all the time in my reporting. But you have to have sources. You have to know who to go to. You know, who's that one individual that has that record, that has that letter? Uh, when we get document or a decree or something that's been issued, the first thing you look for is, has it been signed? You know, if it's been signed, you say, okay, this is, you know, this Pretty is accurate. Easy. And then you pick up the phone and you, and you call the person. But, yes, everybody has their version. So right now they are in the middle of recounting, again, the October ballots that were, there was so much concern of fraud mm -hmm. and corruption. And what happens when they figure out the numbers that maybe Moise and... And Celestine are again number one and two. It's like starting over. Where does it go from there? Well, it's a verification, and they are expected to be completed by next Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, if they are not done, they are right now tabulating, looking at 25% of about 13,000 polling stations, but they are actually putting in the voter IDs for 360,000 voters. But once this commission is done, it then becomes a political you know, hot potato. It's now again. up to, again, it's up to the Electoral Commission, it's up to the president mm -hmm. to decide what do you do? What is the level of fraud that is acceptable? What is not acceptable? Do you stay with these two candidates? Do you just cancel the elections? I mean, we know from the first report that was done that things were a mess. You know, a lot of voters were not identifiable. A lot of these tally sheets, you don't really know who actually, you know, people voted for. And, and meanwhile, I mean, what, what really the story is, the, the hospital is closed. The crews who pick up garbage in the street are not being paid. Mm -hmm. people, people are suffering. Mm -hmm. And, and I, we brought back so much video of, you know, there was a, a woman who died at the steps of the hospital in the emergency mm -hmm. room because it mm -hmm. was closed. Mm -hmm. Tragic. So, yeah. yeah um, and I did see, uh, Jackie, you had a fascinating piece uh, in the Herald uh, over the weekend about uh, an appearance here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Martelly, former mm -hmm. president, um, came back and reappeared as Sweet Mickey, the entertainer, and was ribald and, and sexy. And uh, But he still wants to be uh, a, a respected politician. I mean, it just seems like a, a, an impossible thing. Well, yeah, I mean, he's torn between these two worlds. You have to remember, as Sweet Mickey, before he ran for office in 2010, uh, Michel Matili always crossed the line between music and politics. But now what I found was a former president who wants to resurrect his musical career, but at the same time is remembering that he is a former head of state. And yet he tries to project himself as a political observer rather than a player. And some would argue that he still very much remains a player. You talk about the general hospital. I mean, one of the first things that interim president Jocelyn Prever said when he came into power is that the country's broke. Haiti today owes $2 billion to mm -hmm. Venezuela for Petro Caribe. That is six years after the earthquake where they owed zero. Where has that mm -hmm. money gone? Yeah. The government cannot pay or they're saying that they cannot, you know, make payments to people in, in government jobs. But this was an issue even when President Matili was in power, robbing Peter to pay Paul or delaying here and there. But because you have this interim situation, it makes life very difficult. Yeah. Well, you know, now that you have mentioned Venezuela, we wanted to get to that uh, subject. And Sergio, uh, I, I just don't see how the situation, unless there is open warfare in the streets, I mean, the poor Venezuelan people, I mean, you just can't go buy toothpaste or to toilet paper or corn to make a bread or a repas or whatever you want to make. And uh, crime is up, inflation, their money is worthless, and Maduro just seems incapable of fixing anything. Yeah, I think Senator Rubio, which you, you had interviewed earlier, kind of said it right. It's going to be up to the Venezuelan people. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see what role the U.S. can play other than putting pressure. Mm -hmm. But that is going to have to be resolved because the, the U.S. has already got its plate full in other places. Right. Uh, what happens in Maduro, I, I don't know, because at this point, uh, the pressure is just only going to grow. And I'm originally from Chile. And in the yeah. 70s, what happened there was the same thing, where there's shortages of people. And that's where people get desperate. Mm -hmm. When you can't get toilet paper, mm -hmm. you can't get yeah. toothpaste, the necessities of life. Yeah. And when the government can't deliver on that, 
you've got a really right. uh, a cauldron on your hands. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of desperation, this week, Friday, as a matter of fact, we saw 19 Cuban migrants clinging to that lighthouse. And it appears that that does not qualify for wet foot, dry foot, mm -hmm. or does it? And, and I think this issue, Nancy, just really lays bare the problem with the wet foot, dry foot policy. Mm -hmm. the, what, what happens with these 19 people? Right. Well, you know, their feet are dry now, and they are on American property. So does that count? I don't think that has been determined. Wet foot, dry foot, and the Cuban Adjustment Act, we have urged uh, editorially, uh, really need to be revisited. And, and right. just a few weeks ago, we called for the elimination of the Cuban Adjustment Act, which is fueling the mass immigration through South and Central America. And on an ancillary note, I think it's fascinating. I saw this week that Congressman mm -hmm. Carlos Corbello of Southwest Miami-Dade mm -hmm. has close to 50 co-sponsors now yeah. in the House to right. cut back on benefits for Cubans who are here right. not uh, as political refugees, but as economic, economic refugees. Economic refugees, absolutely. Yeah, the tide is turning. Uh, the po political will is building, but we're not there yet. No, and the Obama administration continues to say no changes are in the offing on wet foot, dry foot, mm -hmm. or the Cuban Adjustment Act. Right. On that note, thank you so much for being with us in the roundtable. You'll all be back, I hope. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Still to come, what happens when policymakers think and act like parents? The answer is next. Here is a live look now from our Fort Lauderdale Tower Cam. Looks hot out there. Here's Weather Authority meteorologist Jennifer Correa with your Sunday forecast. Hi, Jen. Hey, good afternoon, Glenna. Michael, looks uh, looks hot, but looks absolutely gorgeous, right? Temperature is actually warming up to the mid 80s at this hour. Upper 80s if you're in the lower keys. Marathon at 88 degrees. You factor in that heat and humidity. It does feel closer to the 90 degree mark, at least for us in Hialeah. Homestead, uh, 96 a scorcher in marathon actually so it does feel hot out there but you know what so far it's been nice and dry on the radar those dew points actually have dropped slightly since this morning with a northwest wind all ahead of a very weak cold front uh, that cold front will once again continue to sweep through we can still have the chance for an isolated storm but looks very sunny out there so chances are it will be isolated or maybe it just won't happen at all. But anyways, by tomorrow we're expecting less humid conditions. Head out to the beach today. Use that sunscreen. It's very nice out there. The waters are nice and quiet. Highs today forecasted to reach the low 90s. Tomorrow will be in the upper 80s. Glenna. Jennifer, thanks. So this week it got personal. The national conversation over gender identity and who can use which bathroom was mostly a legal and religious debate until the Leighton family stepped forward, as in mom and dad. And anyone watching who is one of those had to have that instinctive primeval connection with parents who just want to protect their most precious ones. Tenured Republican Congresswoman Ileana Ross Leighton and military veteran, former chief prosecutor Dexter Leighton stepped up to the podium this week, but just as Rodrigo's mother and father, and they unveiled a campaign to zero in on the discrimination transgender people face. But more than that, they revealed a private emotional journey that every parent knows in some form or another. It's pretty powerful, strong enough in this case for the Republican rep to break ranks with her party over LGBT rights, a.k.a. human rights. No question our elected leaders make decisions and craft policies through their own personal filters. We saw it when Florida Senate President Andy Gardner, whose son has Down syndrome, put more funding for children with special needs at the top of the legislative agenda and then publicly railed against Governor Scott, who eventually did veto that. In this time when partisan lines are drawn with labels and us versus them means people whose unfamiliar culture, religion, nationality, or lifestyles are considered threatening, it's worth remembering how family ties bind us all in some form or fashion. Maybe policymakers should think more like parents. That's how Rodrigo's mom and dad hit it home this week. So what do you think? We invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. Email, Facebook, Twitter, those are our addresses, we'd like to hear from you. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a beautiful Sunday. See you right back here.